we're going to talk about one last 19th century sculptor. And as you can see, she lives into the 20th century. Um, and so some of her later work is uh, early 20th century. Um, her name is Elisabeth Ney, and she's a German sculptor. Uh, she emigrated to the US, so she's German-American. And of course, uh, at this point, we do have photographs. She was a very eccentric, independent woman. Uh, we'll hear more about that. Uh, although uh, her origins were a more conventional family. She was born in Munster in Westphalia, which is in Western Germany. And her father was a stone cutter. Uh, and he considered himself a sculptor. He was a sculptor of uh, tombstones. So she would have probably had her first training with her father. She was probably learning to cut stone uh, at a very young age. Uh, when she's as young as, say, eight years old, she decides she's going to be a sculptor, which, of course, would have been pretty much unheard of for a woman at that time uh, in Germany. And she remained true to that vision. Uh, when she was a teenager, she went to her parents and insisted that she wanted to go to Berlin and train with the sculptor Christian Daniel Rausch. Well, he was a very famous sculptor of the time. Uh, and the parents were horrified uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, probably their, one of the big reasons was because they were very devout Catholics. And uh, there was a feeling that if she went to a Protestant area of Germany, such as Protestant Berlin, with all these free-thinking people, evidently, uh, that her morals would be compromised. And uh, you know, the, for a young lady to go off uh, unchaperoned uh, to a whole new city, uh, that just just they they just weren't going to have anything to do with that. Also, um, from a practical point of view, it was a very unrealistic goal for a woman. I mean, why would this well-known artist uh, take her on as a uh, assistant or an apprentice or a student? So, you know, they said no. And she went on a hunger strike. Uh, they even called in the bishop <laughs> to reason with her. And they finally came up with a compromise. Um, they said, okay, we're not gonna send you off to Protestant Berlin. But we will allow you to have art training. Uh, you can apply to the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Munich. In Munich. Now, Munich is in Bavaria, uh, in southern Germany. And Bavaria is um, a Catholic area of Germany. Uh, there are areas in Germany that historically remain Catholic. There are areas in Germany uh, that at the time of the Reformation became more Protestant. And, uh, uh, Munich is in uh, Catholic Germany. In fact, I'll just tell you a little story. Um, when I was first in Munich in 1970, uh, when you go walking down the street, uh, people would greet you. It's very friendly. And the greeting, instead of saying Guten Tag, good day, which we always hear is you know, how Germans say hello, it would be Grüß Gott, uh, God's greeting, which I thought was really uh, very interesting. Um, so, She's, going, she's allowed now to go to München. They had uh, people she could stay with that they knew. And uh, of course, first thing, she's rejected. She's female, you know. But she perseveres. And she probably just makes a pest of herself until they say, OK, we'll take you on in trial. You could, you know, we'll see how you do. And she proved herself. Uh, and then they accepted her into the academy, and she graduated with highest honors in eight, 1854. Um, so now she has some really good references. She received a scholarship to the Berlin Academy of, of Art, uh, and she was the first female student uh, to, to be accepted to the Berlin Academy. Um, so now she's finally got her, her wish, she's gone to Berlin. Uh, and she's also able to study with Rausch. Uh, she's got these uh, credentials by this point. Uh, as it turns out, she becomes his favorite pupil, and when he dies, she is the first person who finishes his work that was left incomplete with his death. Now, Berlin was a total change to what she had been used to, uh, and she loved it. 
she became part of the most advanced artistic and literary circles. And um, you know, this was just something that uh, changed her life completely. Um, I thought you probably uh, should see what uh, Rausch was creating. Uh, he was a neoclassical uh, German sculptor. And so here we uh, see one of his statues. And what he was uh, said to do was to pay a great deal of attention to the technique of carving and a great deal of attention to the detail. So this is what Rausch was trained, uh, this is what Rausch trained uh, Ney to do. Uh, his style was a neoclassical style and you were supposed to study Greek statues uh, in the nude. So uh, she was able to study, uh, presumably she's not allowed to study live models, but she can look at uh, the uh, statues from classical antiquity. And uh, he was also, uh, although he, you know, he, he practices neoclassicism, he also has a kind of an overlay or addition of uh, realistic portraiture. And we'll say that this is what Ney does. Uh, she often stays with the neoclassical style, but when you look at her portraits, they become much more realistic. And uh, we'll take a look at her work, of course. One of the things she realized was that if she was going to have a reputation and be able to support herself as an artist, um, she needed to get, I want to say press, but she needed to get known. And one of the ways to do this would be to do a portrait of a famous person. And so she was able to get uh, Schopenhauer to sit for her. You know, he would be part of this, these the intellectual groups. Uh, and he really you know, hadn't listened to most other artists uh, who wanted to you know, portray him, uh, but she was able to get him to sit for her. And this was um, the work of art, uh, the piece that pleased the critics, it pleased the sitter, and it uh, gave her reputation, of course, the, the boost that she needed. One of the things she, she, she believed was she wasn't supposed to just go in and uh, start uh, creating uh, the work that just looks like the outer person. Um, she really wanted to know the sitters. She wanted to get to know them. Um, she didn't want to just sit for you know, a few hours and that was it. Uh, she would talk to them. Uh, she you know, tried to, to get them to converse. Um, because she felt that that's the only way that she could portray more than the uh, outward being, but she could portray the spirit or the uh, character of the person. Uh, so you can see the neoclassical training, but this idea of something that's much more realistic and has um, something where she's really trying to show the character of the, uh, of the sitter. This is a much later bust, but I uh, put it in because I wanted to talk to you about her husband. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said husband yet, but I'll explain that. Um, she was on a trip to Heidelberg uh, when she met uh, a young medical student who, of course, became a medical doctor. Uh, and he also became a philosopher, so we'll talk about that. Uh, his name was Dr. Edmund Duncan Montgomery, uh, as you can see from the, the name, particularly Duncan. Uh, he has uh, some Scottish origin. Um, he is uh, supposed to be a illegitimate child of uh, someone fairly prominent, uh, but they're not sure of that. Uh, but at any rate, um, you know, he's living in Germany, and um, he meets Elizabeth. And they become fast friends, they become lovers, and he wants to marry her. And she keeps saying no. I'm not getting married, that's against my principles. Uh, by this time she had some of these ideas that would have certainly shocked her parents. Uh, she didn't feel that as a woman she should be getting married. Um, whether this was because she didn't want uh, a man to have power over her or because she wanted to dedicate herself to her art or whether she just felt, well, this isn't necessary. It's just you know, some kind of form that people do. So um, it took a while, but uh, finally she, uh, they did get married, but she still wanted the marriage kept secret and she continued to use her maiden name. 
Um, and so a lot of people thought they were just living in sin and uh, she would be ostracized. Uh, so her social life uh, probably would have been a lot easier uh, if she just fessed up and said she was married. Uh, they remained, uh, it seems to have been an excellent marriage uh, right up till the day of her death, as a matter of fact. Now, she was able to get commissions uh, to do the busts of a number of famous men. Her list, uh, uh, King George V of Hanover, uh, his concert master, uh, Joseph Joachim, who became, uh, I guess, a good friend. Uh, and even uh, the uh, Italian, uh, what do you call it, revolutionary patriot, whatever, uh, Garibaldi. Uh, Garibaldi is the person who founds Italy as a unified country. Um, and then, of course, uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Otto von Bismarck. And I think what this look, what you're seeing in the back there is, uh, this is a, a painting of her, a portrait of her. Um, and you see her working on the bust of uh, George V. Uh, maybe I should say something about that. Uh, we think of Germany as a country uh, with a centralized government. Uh, but Germany was not yet one country. In fact, uh, Bismarck was trying to create a, a confederation and a, a unified Germany. Um, but many of the parts of Germany were ruled by different uh, princes. Uh, for example, the King of Hanover, and, and George V was the last King of Hanover. Uh, and we'll also be hearing about uh, the uh, King of Bavaria in just a moment. Uh, here is her bust of Otto von Bismarck. He was the Chancellor of Germany. And uh, this was actually commissioned by the King of Prussia, Wilhelm of Prussia. Um, Bismarck is uh, a notable figure in history. Uh, and this is where her life gets kind of murky, almost like a spy story. And we're not quite sure what's going on. Uh, but she gets to know Wilhelm, and there is a story there's, let's just say there's a strong possibility that he thinks he wants to use her uh, for some of his political goals. Uh, because as a sculptor, he thinks she can get closer to um, the king of Bavaria, as we'll see. He wanted Bavaria to join his German confederation. And he wanted Bavaria to join Prussia in attacking France to, create, to uh, side with them in the Franco-Prussian War, which was imminent. So he arranges for Elizabeth Ney to carve statue of King Ludwig II of Bavaria. Now, you may have heard of King Ludwig. Uh, he's often called Mad King Ludwig, or uh, as they say in German, uh, Geistliche Kronk which translates literally, I guess, as uh, spiritually ill, mentally ill, we would say. Um, and of course, we don't know, really, was he mentally ill? Uh, was this a calumny? Uh, what we do know was that he was devoted to art and music. Uh, he is the king who was the great patron of Wagner. Um, he uh, had many castles built. The most famous one um, is Neuschwanstein. And you've probably seen pictures of Neuschwanstein. Uh, and if you haven't, you've seen um, its more diminutive uh, copy. Uh, Cinderella's castle at Disney World uh, was based on King Ludwig's uh, castle at Neuschwanstein. Um, I've been there. I don't remember a whole lot. It was a long time ago. The thing I remember is it was very high on a hill, so you have to walk, walk up. And then it had many, many stories, so you had to walk, walk, walk. Um, the thing that impressed me, I remember, was walking into an upper room, and it was almost like a hallway between two rooms or a small room, and it had a grotto in it. <laughs> I mean, he had this big grotto down below um, where they were supposed to put on Wagnerian operas, but I gather the uh, acoustics weren't what they had hoped. Uh, but here was a little interior grotto with water uh, playing over stones. And then the next room was the medieval room. And it had all sorts of uh, uh, 19th century uh, 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 Gothic revival tracery. And I was just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so this is, this is, let's just say it was somebody's fantasy. And um, you can either look at it and say, oh, no, no, what's he doing this for? Or you can say, wow, what fun. Um, I'll choose what fun. Um, so 
Ludwig had his problems, undoubtedly. Um, it was, at first, very, very difficult for her to get to know him. Um, she, um, there's, there's a wonderful story about it, actually. Uh, he was evidently a little nervous around women or something. But, um, you know, she comes in and he says, okay, we'll get to work. And she proceeds. She says, I'll get to work when I'm, when I'm ready. And she proceeds. She wants to talk to him first. She wants to get to know him first. And she also wants to measure his, you know, different parts of his face and things. Uh, so, you know, she's, she's going to create this, this bust, and then she's going to create her full-size statue, uh, which we see here. Um, so, you know, he's, he's just not warming up to her at first. And uh, as I said, he, he loves art, he loves music, and he's listening to someone read uh, Iphigenia. And so one day she comes in in Greek costume and proceeds to recite from the Greek play. And that's, you know, that just, I mean, she's eccentric enough to do that, but it's also the thing that just, you know, breaks the ice and, uh, you know, she gets his confidence and she's able to uh, create these works of art. Uh, as you see here, there's a very elaborate statue with lots of, lots of detail in the carving. Uh, it's almost complete, uh, which we see here, uh, when suddenly she's denied access to the king. She's also summoned to the Prussian embassy. Now, we don't know. We know what she did. She uh, took off. She fled. What one idea is that happened was, as we said, that Bismarck wanted her to gain the trust of Ludwig. And then somehow he wanted her to convince Ludwig uh, to join with the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War. Well, Ludwig's talking to Ney uh, about peace and uh, beauty. <laughs> he wants beauty and peace for his people. Uh, this isn't exactly what the Prussians wanted. Uh, so it may be that she was not doing what they wanted her to do. And evidently, the advisors around the king um, were Prussian sympathizers. So what happens, uh, and, and you know, a lot of this is, is speculation, of course, um, you know, that supposedly she was supposed to be like this undercover agent and didn't do it. <laughs> it wasn't her principles. Uh, and as you remember, she's a woman who uh, can be very, very unconventional and uh, not do what other people tells her to, tell, tell her to do. Um, so basically she says, you know, she's not gonna do what they're telling her. She's not going to the Prussian embassy. She's, she sees this as a big threat. Um, and Ney, uh, uh, her husband, Montgomery, uh, Dr. Montgomery by this time, and uh, a very loyal servant who was with them pretty much for their life, uh, they flee to America. Now, uh, Dr. Montgomery had a friend who was living at a utopian community uh, in Georgia. And he said, oh, come, come and live with us. And uh, they went. Uh, it didn't work out terribly well. The friend got very, very ill and returned to Germany and died. Um, the community collapsed. Um, and I think there was also some, uh, like I said, she didn't admit she was married to him, so there was some ill feeling about uh, uh, their supposedly immoral relationship. But whatever it was, the community collapsed and uh, that wasn't working out. So she starts visiting all sorts of places. Uh, to try to find a new location to, to, to move to. Um, they have this idea of wanting to live in nature and beauty. Uh, uh, and as we say, they have a, a lot of philosophical ideas. Um, and one of the times they go is uh, to Texas. And they find this um, post-bellum <laughs> plantation uh, called uh, Leendo. Leendo. And uh, it's uh, near Houston, it's uh, Hempstead, Texas, and she's supposed to have gone in, so we'll show you a picture of it in a minute, but uh, uh, she's supposed to have gone in there and uh, threw open, you know, gone upstairs and threw open the shutters and said, I am going to live here for the rest of my life. You know, it's a very beautiful, uh, natural area um, and kind of out uh, in the middle of nowhere because, of course, uh, the cities of Texas uh, were still, um, let's just say, in, in, being formed. <laughs> um, 
weren't any real urban areas. So here we see, uh, I found this on the web, uh, so this is what it looks like today, uh, but you see the, uh, the house at the plantation. Uh, they were seeking an ideal life to have peace in the beauty of nature. Uh, Edmund loved it. He basically devoted himself to philosophical writing. Um, and he could keep in touch with uh, writing to people in Europe. So you know, he wasn't totally isolated, as, as you might think. Uh, um, but there were some problems, <laughs> economic ones, for one thing. Uh, Ney gave up her art to raise her children and to run the plantation. And there were a lot of difficulties. She hadn't got a clue of how to run a plantation. So she had a lot of difficulties with that. Um, and making a profit and, and what to plant and you know how to get the workers to work and uh, um, various things. And then, of course, the great tragedies were her children. She had two sons. And shortly after moving to the plantation, her, uh, her first child, Arthur, died of diphtheria. Um, her second child became totally alienated from his mother, um, perhaps because her first child had died she may have become very, very protective and maybe overprotective. Um, it also may be because she was so eccentric that you know, he was embarrassed by his mother. Um, there's all sorts of possible reasons. Um, but it's, it's very tragic. Uh, later on, she has a, a, a bust that she had done of him, and instead of calling it, oh, the bust of my son, Lauren, she calls it the young violinist. Uh, it's like she's not even admitting that he is her son, uh, because the relationship is so bad. Uh, so very sad there. Well, it may have been good for uh, Edmund, but Elizabeth Ney was really isolated out there on that plantation. Um, and eventually she uh, moves to the state capitol. Um, she builds a studio there, which we see what it looks like today. It's now the Elizabeth Ney Museum in uh, Austin. And uh, she names it Formoso. Uh, they name buildings. And uh, she starts. Uh, creating her sculpture. Now, she and Edmund are not um, estranged. He lives mostly in um, the plantation, and she's more in Austin. But they commute, as it were. Uh, they take the train. Uh, it's undoubtedly a long commute. But um, you know, they do visit each other. They stay with each other. They do go back and forth. And uh, when she does eventually die, um, her husband hears about it, and well, actually, it's before she dies. Hope that she won't. She has a heart attack, and uh, he immediately comes to her side and just stays with her for the months that live up that lead up to his death, uh, to take care of her and to be with her. Um, so here we see her studio, which is a little, uh, it's a little. Uh, you can see, it looks like a little like a castle with a sort of Greek portico on it. A uh, little picture from inside, as I say, it's now a museum, so a number of her busts uh, are in the museum. Um, she was having a lot of financial difficulties. I mean, they were, you know, she was trying to build this studio and build up a business out in the sort of the wilds of Texas. Uh, Austin was a state capital, uh, so there were people who had more uh, desire to have a uh, enriched cultural and artistic um, Experience, and they wanted to, you know, to, to build this up in Texas. Um, so that was one of the things that she did. Uh, she was able uh, to uh, to start making contacts and becoming sort of a center for uh, art, you know, culture, and art. <laughs> uh, one of the things that really helped her out, as far as the financial uh, and also. They, well, having the reputation and getting commissions uh, and having the financial wherewithal to do everything are sort of intertwined. Um, in 1901, uh, she received a, a uh, is grant the word? She's receiving payment uh, from the state uh, legislature uh, to create three different statues of uh, famous men from Texas. 
Uh, one is a life-size statue of Stephen Austin, and she also does busts. Uh, so you'll see sometimes the, the bust and then the statue both. Uh, she has uh, another statue of Sam Houston. And the other one, which I don't have any pictures of, uh, is the uh, a statue of a, a Confederate general, uh, Albert Johnston. So now her drawing room in the salon, she actually did, she designs this building and she has not just a, you know, a studio room, but uh, a drawing room uh, uh, with the studio attached or attached to the studio really. Uh, and that becomes the place where um, the uh, Texans who are interested in art and intellectual conversation come. So it's kind of like bringing a salon uh, to, bringing culture to Texas. <laughs> Um, and it becomes a, a social and uh, uh, cultural center. Evidently, in the capital, um, being exotic and being eccentric is a little more accepted. Uh, so it becomes kind of a celebrity, and uh, they you know, will tolerate her differences, perhaps. Um, here is the bust of Sam, uh, Sam Houston. Uh, once again, it's very realistic images, but the sort of neoclassical format uh, it looks like he's wearing some kind of drapery, not exactly a toga, uh, but a drapery wrapped around. And, you know, it reminds you of, of the busts of uh, uh, Romans. Uh, at the same time, it's definitely a very realistic image of Sam Houston. So you have uh, the neoclassical dignity and uh, uh, the realism and character. So it's a kind of combination of the two styles. Um, these are the statues that she created uh, for uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Austin and Sam Houston, uh, which today are in uh, Washington, D.C., in the U.S. Capitol, uh, in Statuary Hall. And uh, different statues uh, that represent different states or are from different states have been donated. Uh, and these, of course, are uh, to represent Texas. And uh, you can see she has uh, Steve, uh, Stephen, Aust Stephen Austin with the the gun, you know, he's the frontiersman, but he's also uh, got a role of, uh, of uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to be, but it you know, shows perhaps an intellectual activity. Uh, Sam Houston is wearing uh, sort of a fringed uh, frontiersman's costume, uh, but is in the kind of pose that you might almost expect, uh, you know, the uh, classical Roman. So once again, it's that kind of combination of realism and of, uh, And, and of neoclassicism. Uh, this is a bust that's in the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And uh, it's um, Julia Peace. And I didn't know who this was, so I looked her up on the web. And I found out who she was. Uh, she was the daughter of a Texas governor. And she was very, uh, they called her a club woman. Uh, she was very active in Texas cultural and artistic organizations. Uh, she's, was an art patron, obviously, having uh, Elizabeth Ney do this. And there was, um, when Ney died, there was an organization called the Texas Fine Arts Organization. So they, this was made up mostly of these women who are interested in art and culture. And uh, so she is one of them. And she is one of the women who helped preserve uh, Ney's studio and make it into the art museum that it is uh, today. Um, the, the bust is rather wonderful uh, because you really can see uh, the quality of her carving here. Uh, you have that serenity that we associate with neoclassicism, but not the blank, overly idealized forms. It's a realistic lifeness. Uh, there's the softness of uh, the, the cheeks. Uh, there's the subtle texture. It's got kind of a rich texture here of the hair. Uh, bound up uh, with the curls, uh, well, the heartbreakers as they call them, uh, coming down. And then this very, very subtle texture of the uh, lace on the garment. So uh, it's you know, this wonderful, once again, combination of, of the neoclassical serenity with uh, uh, realism here, which is a beautiful realism. You know, the idea was we're supposed to be beauty to Texas. We're now going to look at one of her final works, uh, which is a life-size statue of Lady Macbeth. It's in the National Museum of American Art. And when I saw it, I was really struck by it. Um, I suspect that's probably my favorite, favorite work of art in the museum. Um, and uh, 
for various reasons, but uh, it was something that I just thought was a, a wonderful representation of uh, Lady Macbeth. And here, I think the realism is uh, coming on even more strong. It's her most ambitious work. Um, I consider it the most successful work. Um, when you're looking at uh, Sam Houston and, and um, Sam, yeah, and uh, Stephen Austin, the anatomy doesn't really come through as strongly as perhaps uh, you might expect, but here it does. I mean, she obviously has uh, the anatomy down pat. Um, and what's very interesting is this, this kind of conflict which we would expect from Lady Macbeth. It's the sleepwalking scene uh, from Macbeth, and she's wringing her hands. Uh, and so what we have is a figure that's in a contraposto, uh, this graceful twist to the body when you have your weight on one leg and it forms a kind of S or reverse S curve to the body. Uh, this is very graceful, goes back to classical antiquity. Uh, and yet there are angular forms. Uh, we'll take some, look at some details of things like her elbows. And, uh, and that really does convey this idea of conflict, which of course is, is what's part of, um, of the subject. Uh, it's the sleepwalking scene from uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth. And of course she wrings her hand, she's sleepwalking, she's feeling the guilt of uh, the, the death of Duncan and, and others. And uh, she's uh, trying to wash the blood from her hands. And she goes, out damned spot, out I say. Uh, so she's trying to wash this imaginary blood, this blood of guilt uh, off from her hands. So we see this wonderful, delicate, beautiful hands uh, entwined and you know, in action uh, as she's you know, really trying to, to wash the hands. Uh, the face is remarkable too. It's not an idealized neoclassical face of you know beauty. Uh, it's this very strong face, uh, with very strong features. It's not uh, has angular forms to it, uh, which makes it so much more powerful than it was some sort of smoothed over, uh, perfect uh, uh, neoclassical ideal oval with uh, totally regular features. Uh, I'd say, you know, the neoclassicism is still there in the grace of the figure because there is a, a grace to it. Um, but certainly she has that idea of creating something that is more um, emotive and, and more realistic. So this is, uh, it, perhaps even more than anything else I've seen uh, that she's done, is the departure from the serenity and the perfect idealism uh, of uh, Greek art that you uh, associate with neoclassicism. And she's bringing in, of course, a realistic uh, image and also uh, perhaps a, a romantic image in the sense of romantic as showing emotion. Uh, so we're showing the this, this strong emotion here. Um, the romantics also loved uh, literary subjects and, of course, Shakespeare, definitely. Uh, here's some other details. Uh, that was one of the things that was fascinating. I just took all sorts of pictures. It is white marble. Uh, when you're taking photographs in museums, you have to use whatever the light is. And I usually try to use, uh, or I used to use, uh, a tungsten film and then have the film push two stops, uh, which works very well if you have halogen lighting. However, if you have, you don't always know what kind of lighting the museums have. Uh, so sometimes the, they come out too gold or too brown. So I've tried to adjust these down. Uh, but as I say, it is white marble. Um, and look at the wonderful details of the drapery, you know, falling uh, in very wonderful folds. And as I, I just feel like it's this combination of showing the body of a sense of grace uh, and movement and at the same time, there's the angularity of the form. So it just everything works. And I, I always thought this wonderful uh, view here, we're really right on to the elbow, uh, which gives you that kind of angularity of form. Here's another view. See the same thing uh, and the, the conflict of the pose. Uh, the hair is wonderful. The hair is cascading down her back. And uh, so you have these uh, wonderful textures here. 
uh, you know, if all we did was have this detail of the profile of the face, uh, you know, we just, oh, what a beautiful picture it was. Uh, 